Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last week, we've had two rocket launches. This is Deep Space Update for December 5th, 2021. And I'm actually going to say, we would have only had one launch if I'd recorded this yesterday as planned, except that there was too much noise in the neighborhood. So yes, earlier in the week, SpaceX had their big launch. It was a Starlink launch with a pair of Black Sky satellites riding along as rideshare. So Black Sky is a company that provides Earth imaging for uh, private customers. They provide three meters imaging from their black sky satellites and two of them were along on the Starlink flight but you know back in November uh, Electron they actually flew two black sky satellites as well and I'm gonna say it was probably a whole lot cheaper to fly on the Starlink rideshare but then again they probably couldn't pick their orbit so anyway this flight I think it means now that SpaceX has launched more rockets this year than in any previous year and on top of that I think SpaceX is also setting records for mass to orbit via private company and number of satellites launched in a single year now the of course China is still launching more vehicles overall but that is an entire nation anyway the other launch that happened this week was a pair of Galileo satellites by European Space Agency and that launched on board a Soyuz from Kourou in South America um, now this was supposed to launch on Friday afternoon and as we got down to like the last minute before launch there was a red light on the warning board saying Meteo and given that I grew up playing video games in the 1990s I immediately thought of the Final Fantasy spell the most powerful fire spell in the game but actually this is just the French word for weather. There was also supposed to be an Atlas V launch as part of the space test program this morning. STP-3 was supposed to launch much earlier in the year, but after a launch with a new uh, Centaur engine, uh, upper stage engine, they noticed there was some oscillations and they wanted to like delay the STP-3 launch until they had investigated this. So presumably at this point, they understand the nature of those oscillations and have taken any necessary action. And that was supposed to launch this morning. It will probably launch tomorrow morning at about, you know, ridiculous AM. Elsewhere, there's been a lot of interesting uh, contracts and stuff being signed in the first week of December. Most interestingly, I think, is the commercial LEO destinations where we just had the phase one awards given out to the companies that want to build the commercial replacement for the International Space Station. Now, I did a more detailed video on this earlier, but we've now actually seen who's got the money. And the, the winners for this phase one award to basically figure out whether their thing is viable and flesh out the design and possibly build some demonstration or mock-ups uh, Blue Origin and Sierra have the Orbital Reef. They got $130 million. Uh, there was Nanorax working with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin. They have Starlab. That is $160 million they got for their design. And there's Northrop Grumman and Dynetics, which we didn't previously see what they had, but they've got $125.6 million. And yeah, this is, we don't know exactly what their thing is but they did include an image on the NASA announcement and unlike well it's interesting that it shows this sort of modular station but what I noticed was that it had a Dragon spacecraft docking to the bottom except that it wasn't docking because it didn't have its door open on the front so it's just got its door nose and it's like booping against a docking port but yeah Northrop Grumman they're building the halo the habitation and logistics uh, module for the international space state uh, sorry, sorry the the lunar gateway so you know they've already got some uh, they've got some background there I guess they're the only one by the way of the three that doesn't include inflatable modules in any of their renders so yeah that's an interesting point Anyway, uh, we'll see where this goes. This is not going to guarantee that any one of these companies actually launches it. These are just the ones getting funding. There was also um, an Office of the Inspector General report released a couple of days beforehand saying that the current plans are unlikely to ensure continuous space operation between the International Space Station and these commercial destinations as it is. So NASA may need to find extra money for the International Space Station or perhaps fund Axiom to actually undock their thing. Not clear what's going to happen, but it is nine years away. Northrop Grumman, they also got a contract to uh, continue supplying solid rocket boosters for SLS, and that will bring them through something like Flight 8. 
uh, which is interesting because by the end of this contract, they will have run out all of the spare parts for the old shuttle boosters. I mean, you may not realize this, but the boosters that are flying on Artemis 1, those segments have all flown on space shuttles. I think some of the booster segments date back to the 1980s. So this contract also includes designing a new next generation solid rocket motor for the SLS. So this is called the Booster and Obsolescence, Booster Obsolescence and Life Extension Program. So this, these will be next generation designs. They're gonna switch away from the steel to carbon fiber composite casings. Um, they're gonna change some of the, a lot of the avionics and the thrust vectoring, the nozzle vectoring, is going to be powered by batteries instead of like a hydrazine powered APU. So these are going to be your radical redesigns. They're going to have a whole bunch of tests and hopefully they will fly and SLS, you know, will keep flying for as long as there's money to support it. Um, also, SpaceX got a contract for three more flights to the International Space Station for their Crew Dragon spacecraft. That is to carry NASA over from the end of the current commercial crew contract to the start of the next one. So NASA have already announced that they're looking for like the next set of commercial crew partners. Uh, you, if you remember, they did this back you know years ago and there was all sorts of different ideas and Boeing and SpaceX ultimately won. They're gonna open this up again. And I think one possible contender could be Sierra Space who have, of course, the, the Dream Chaser. The Dream Chaser was pitched as a crew vehicle at one point, but it wasn't, it wasn't given the money for the final push. By the time 2027 rolls around, they should have had a lot of cargo experience, so they might have a more viable, more, bigger chance of being included in this. Boeing, um, well, I'm presuming they will rebid Starliner for this, but of course, that will mean that they need to move Starliner to a different launch vehicle because uh, all the Atlas Vs are gone and, you know, Amazon have bought them. I guess they could ask Amazon if they have them in stock. Anyway, uh, it also is interesting, by the way, because of the delays in Boeing's launch, SpaceX is going to complete their six commercial launches. It looks like they're going to complete all six of their commercial launches that they're contracted for before Boeing get their first actual production Starliner to the International Space Station. Uh, and by the way, that does mean that Crew-5 and Crew-6 will both be part of Expedition 69. Nice. Up in the International Space Station, they had a, an EVA to replace an antenna that's used by the TDRS system. This would be Tom Marshburn and Kayla Barron. That's Tom's fifth spacewalk and Kayla's first spacewalk. I think she's one of the youngest astronauts in the core right now. Uh, it was planned for earlier in the week, but then with a potential debris encounter, they delayed it by a day until they could figure that out. They did the spacewalk. It was pretty much trouble-free, six and a half hours of maintenance. And uh, yeah, then they actually made the maneuver in the space station to avoid a future close encounter with this piece of debris, which I believe comes from a Pegasus rocket launched a couple of decades ago. SpaceX were also heavily in the news earlier in the week because an email from Elon leaked saying that uh, we need to fix Raptor production at SpaceX because Raptor production is going to hold up the ability to fly Starship every couple of weeks, which is what's required to build out the next generation of Starlink. And without the next generation of Starlink, SpaceX could go bankrupt. And of course, everybody took this email and ran in different directions depending upon their biases. And, and I'm going to say, I don't think you need three days of Thanksgiving weekend to solve a Raptor problem for next week, year. But that's me as a reasonable person that has long since gone through that startup crunch. I've been there, it didn't work. Anyway, um, yeah, the whole prospect of SpaceX going bankrupt is technically possible, right? Because SpaceX are building out this expensive uh, satellite network and they've got a limited amount of income so they need to borrow against this. And that means they need investor funding. But if investor funding, say, dries up because there's a market crash and there's no money available, then yes, SpaceX might have a problem with their cash flow and Elon might have to sell some of his Tesla stock or something like that to fund it. Um, I don't think it's reasonable, but I, I do think that, I, I do think that Starlink in its current form is commercially viable, but not as viable to the point of utterly destroying any competition out there. Like Kuiper and OneWeb definitely have a chance to be, you know, viable satellite networks for you know, broadband internet. 
Starlink is clearly the one that's available right now and clearly the one that everybody's talking about. The problem with Starlink right now, actually, isn't that they don't have enough satellites. It's that they don't have enough base stations. They're having trouble building the base stations due to lack of hardware and supply chains. And that is actually also making it harder for them to bring in money. Although, you know, they're still not... They're, they might have like half a million customers waiting for this. But that that's only going to fund, you know, a limited amount of this. Look, regardless, I don't think it's... This isn't like death to SpaceX. And this is, this is definitely Elon being the bad boss who's pushing his people way too hard, in my mind. But I, I wouldn't say that it's the, you know, the absolute drama, the end of SpaceX, and neither is it, uh, <laughs> neither is it a good sign. Whatever, I, I didn't think too much of it. Uh, Rocket Lab, they also announced uh, their new Neutron redesign. Uh, I, of course, made a video about that earlier in the week. It is a radical redesign of Neutron, which was, of course, on still just a rocket on paper, but it's now using a methane propellant. The vehicle is a lot wider. It's about seven meters in diameter instead of five meters in diameter. It has these interesting strakes that turn into landing legs. It has fairings which are captive and are look an awful lot like you only live twice and a second stage which is extraordinarily light according to Peter Beck um, haven't heard a lot about volcano bases oh yeah and the whole thing's built out of carbon fiber yeah Saturday morning there was a solar eclipse over Antarctica so I imagine all the Airbnbs in Antarctica were sold out uh, we did, if you were elsewhere in the world, you just had to make do with a live stream from NASA. And if you were on the space station, then you got this amazing view showing the satellite, uh, showing the shadow, like obliquely running over the edge of the planet. This is an amazing shot. And speaking of amazing shots, NASA also published a lot of the photographs that Thomas Pesquet took during the Crew 2 departure from the International Space Station. They did this fly around and they took a lot of images for future reference and just because they look really pretty, showing the International Space Station with the new Nauka module attached to it. Yeah, I wish we, I want to see more of those. I want to turn them into a movie. Uh, and yeah, speaking of Crew, very likely that tomorrow morning we're going to find out the new uh, selection of NASA astronauts. And yes, I know tens of thousands of people applied. Lots of people emailed me telling me they applied. I, I hope you succeeded because I'm pretty sure I didn't. I applied and up until today I can say they haven't rejected me. As of tomorrow, I'm probably going to be a rejected astronaut. But that's okay because I still, uh, I, I know you guys love me, right? <laughs> but seriously, I, I'm really curious to see, uh, you know, what, who gets selected and, you know, whether I know any of them in some form or another. I'm also cu really curious if any of them have had some serious time with Kerbal Space Program because that game's been around for like 10 years and a lot of space adjacent people have been playing it. Uh, like, will we see a Jeb plushie as a zero G uh, indicator in a future space flight? I don't know. We're going to find out tomorrow. Also, in the coming week, one thing to watch for is Soyuz MS-20. And I know as a music nerd, MS-20 for me has always meant the Korg MS-20 synthesizer. But now it's Yusaka Maezawa's flight to the International Space Station. The first tourist flight in over a decade. It's going to be him, his Instagram editor, and a Russian pilot. This is going to be, uh, you know, modified... Well, I mean, they've done this again. It's going to be a modified Soyuz that's able to be flown by one cosmonaut. Uh, so th this is obviously the same guy that put a lot of money into Starship to Dear Moon. And uh, he wants to fly to space again. But this will be his first flight to space. And hey, I'm sure we'll get some really cool stuff on his Instagram. So that is my Deep Space update for this week. See you all next week. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.